who was Frederick Douglass. Many contemporary scholars of race consider Frederick Douglass, born Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey. 1818-1895, to be the first liberatory African-American intellectual. In 1873, he was the vice presidential candidate when Victoria Woodhull was the first woman to run for U.S. president. Douglas began life as a slave, but was taught to read at the age of 12 by his owner's sister-in-law. He taught other slaves to read, and after a series of failed escapes he finally gained his freedom and became active in the Massachusetts anti-slavery movement. At 23 he began his distinguished and inspiring career of public speaking. He was present at the Seneca Falls Convention, where the American suffragist movement originated in 1848. Douglas toured Ireland and England in the mid-1840s. And his supporters raised money to legally purchase his freedom in 1856 back in the United States. Douglas published newspapers, the most famous of which was the North Star, which had as the motto right is of no sex truth is of no color God is the father of us all, and we are all brethren. In the 1850s, Douglas spoke for school desegregation in New York. During the U.S. Civil War, he promoted the rights of blacks to fight for the Union. When the Emancipation Proclamation was issued in 1862, he said, We were waiting and listening as for a bolt from the sky, we were watching, by the dim light of the stars for the dawn of a new day, we were longing for the answer to the agonizing prayers of centuries. In 1884, after his first wife had died, Douglas married Helen Pitts, a white suffragist from New York. Pitts had worked on Alpha, the 19th century radical women's publication. While living in Washington, D.C., Douglas' main writings are a narrative of the life of Frederick Douglas. An American slave, 1845, The Heroic Slave, Autographs for Freedom, 1853. My Bondage and My Freedom, 1855, and Life and Times of Frederick Douglass, 1881, Revised, 1892. He edited the North Star from 1847 to 1851, after which it became the Frederick Douglass paper. Who was Frederick Douglass? Many contemporary scholars of race consider Frederick Douglass, born Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey. 1818-1895, to be the first liberatory African-American intellectual. In 1873, he was the vice presidential candidate when Victoria Woodhull was the first woman to run for U.S. president. Douglas began life as a slave, but was taught to read at the age of 12 by his owner's sister-in-law. He taught other slaves to read, and after a series of failed escapes he finally gained his freedom and became active in the Massachusetts anti-slavery movement. At 23 he began his distinguished and inspiring career of public speaking. 
he was present at the Seneca Falls Convention, where the American suffragist movement originated in 1848. Douglas toured Ireland and England in the mid-1840s. And his supporters raised money to legally purchase his freedom in 1856. Back in the United States. Douglas published newspapers, the most famous of which was the North Star. Which had as the motto right is of no sex truth is of no color God is the father of us all, and we are all brethren. In the 1850s, Douglas spoke for school desegregation in New York. During the U.S. Civil War. He promoted the rights of blacks to fight for the Union. When the Emancipation Proclamation was issued in 1862, he said. We were waiting and listening as for a bolt from the sky, we were watching, by the dim light of the stars for the dawn of a new day, we were longing for the answer to the agonizing prayers of centuries. In 1884, after his first wife had died, Douglas married Helen Pitts, a white suffragist from New York. Pitts had worked on Alpha, the 19th century radical women's publication. While living in Washington, D.C., Douglas' main writings are a narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. An American Slave, 1845, The Heroic Slave, Autographs for Freedom, 1853. My Bondage and My Freedom, 1855, and Life and Times of Frederick Douglass, 1881 revised, 1892. He edited the North Star from 1847 to 1851, after which it became the Frederick Douglass paper. What was evolutionary thought like in America during the 19th century? Within educated communities, Charles Darwin's theory of evolution was broadly accepted as an accurate history of living beings. Since deism, or the idea that God was suffused throughout nature, was a widespread perspective at the time. There was not an obvious conflict between religious accounts of creation and evolution. Discussion more commonly centered on whether social forms of evolution were ruthlessly competitive or cooperative. As in 19th century European thought, there were two perspectives, life in society. As in nature, was read in tooth and claw and a matter of survival of the fittest. Or, life in society, as in nature, evolved through cooperation. It is not surprising that the transcendentalists favored the cooperative view. What was evolutionary thought like in America during the 19th century? Within educated communities, Charles Darwin's theory of evolution was broadly accepted as an accurate history of living beings. Since deism, or the idea that God was suffused throughout nature, was a widespread perspective at the time. There was not an obvious conflict between religious accounts of creation and evolution. Discussion more commonly centered on whether social forms of evolution were ruthlessly competitive or cooperative. 
As in 19th century European thought, there were two perspectives, life in society. As in nature, was read in tooth and claw and a matter of survival of the fittest. Or, life in society, as in nature, evolved through cooperation. It is not surprising that the transcendentalists favored the cooperative view. What was social Darwinism? Social Darwinism was an application of the Darwinian idea of the, the survival of the fittest to inequalities and opportunities in contemporary 19th century society. It was an age in which the enterprising could amass large fortunes in a short period of time. Although they had to compete with other capitalists. And those who labored, often in unhealthy and exhausting conditions for barely enough pay to support themselves. Also competed among themselves for available jobs. Social Darwinists wrote popular books, sometimes consisting of what today would be considered racist or class-based eugenics. And their claims made a strong impression on general readers. They shared a belief that competition was valuable in itself and that those who failed in life's contests failed a deeper test of evolutionary survival. Instead of social reform, their ideals were to encourage the traits that enabled success at competition by means of selective human breeding, as well as moral approval of the winners. What was social Darwinism? Social Darwinism was an application of the Darwinian idea of the, the survival of the fittest to inequalities and opportunities in contemporary 19th century society. It was an age in which the enterprising could amass large fortunes in a short period of time. Although they had to compete with other capitalists and those who labored, often in unhealthy and exhausting conditions for barely enough pay to support themselves. Also competed among themselves for available jobs. Social Darwinists wrote popular books, sometimes consisting of what today would be considered racist or class-based eugenics. And their claims made a strong impression on general readers. They shared a belief that competition was valuable in itself and that those who failed in life's contests failed a deeper test of evolutionary survival. Instead of social reform, their ideals were to encourage the traits that enabled success at competition by means of selective human breeding, as well as moral approval of the winners. Who were the main social Darwinists? William Graham Sumner, 1840-1910, professor at Yale. Was the American version of the English evolutionist Herbert Spencer, 1820-1903. Sumner was a strong advocate of unrestricted capitalism. He was famous for his essay The Man of Virtue, which promoted self-interest as a primary duty for individuals. 
The industrialist Andrew Carnegie, 1835 to 1919, built on these ideas in his The Gospel of Wealth, which further enshrined the law of competition as a natural principle of progress. Who were the main social Darwinists? William Graham Sumner, 1840-1910, professor at Yale, was the American version of the English evolutionist Herbert Spencer, 1820-1903. Sumner was a strong advocate of unrestricted capitalism. He was famous for his essay The Man of Virtue, which promoted self-interest as a primary duty for individuals. The industrialist Andrew Carnegie, 1835-1919, built on these ideas in his The Gospel of Wealth which further enshrined the law of competition as a natural principle of progress. Did 19th century American philosophers directly take up evolution? Yes. Both John Fiske, 1842-1901, and Chauncey Wright, 1830-1875, believed in the evolution of consciousness and human morality. Fiske was best known as an historian for his two-volume The American Revolution, 1891. Wright was an empiricist philosopher of science who opposed transcendentalism and was to be influential in subsequent pragmatist thought, although he himself published very little. Lester Ward, 1841-1912, was a sociologist best known for dynamic sociology. 1883 but his main ideas in favor of intervention in social evolutionary processes proved to be relevant for future social and political philosophy. Did 19th century American philosophers directly take up evolution? Yes. Both John Fiske, 1842-1901, and Chauncey Wright, 1830-1875, believed in the evolution of consciousness and human morality. Fiske was best known as an historian for his two-volume The American Revolution, 1891. Wright was an empiricist philosopher of science who opposed transcendentalism and was to be influential in subsequent pragmatist thought, although he himself published very little. Lester Ward, 1841-1912, was a sociologist best known for dynamic sociology. 1883 but his main ideas in favor of intervention in social evolutionary processes proved to be relevant for future social and political philosophy. Was 19th century evolutionary thought connected to ideas of progress? Not directly, because evolution was an external force, 
whereas progress depended on individual human effort. But the two notions were frequently associated, as in the ideas of American industrialist Andrew Carnegie. In general, notions of progress formed both ideals and practical motivations. Society as a whole was believed to be progressing. And individuals were motivated to advance in life by becoming materially prosperous. The prosperity of society was largely believed to be a matter of technology. The 19th century was the first full-fledged machine age. And it saw the inventions and wide use of the cotton gin, locomotive, telegraph, and electric lights, to name just a few. Was 19th century evolutionary thought connected to ideas of progress? Not directly, because evolution was an external force, whereas progress depended on individual human effort. But the two notions were frequently associated, as in the ideas of American industrialist Andrew Carnegie. In general, notions of progress formed both ideals and practical motivations. Society as a whole was believed to be progressing. And individuals were motivated to advance in life by becoming materially prosperous. The prosperity of society was largely believed to be a matter of technology. The 19th century was the first full fledged machine age. And it saw the inventions and wide use of the cotton gin, locomotive, telegraph, and electric lights, to name just a few. Was social Darwinism a beneficial set of beliefs? Most progressives thought not. First, social Darwinism tended to accept, if not applaud, the suffering of the poor. As though it reflected their personal weakness rather than the structure of society. And second, social Darwinism evolved into a reactionary type of white supremacy. Toward the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th, social Darwinism and its associated eugenics merged with white American racialist beliefs that would later be considered racist or discriminatory. For example, in 1916 amateur anthropologist and lawyer Madison Grant published The Passing of the Great Race, or, The Racial Basis of European History. Grant propounded a theory of Nordic superiority and argued for a public eugenic program to save the Nordics from being overrun by non-white racial groups. Grant's book sold 1,600,000 copies by 1937. It was widely influential in individual beliefs and public policy that restricted immigration from Asia and discriminated harshly against African Americans. Was social Darwinism a beneficial set of beliefs? Most progressives thought not. First, social Darwinism tended to accept, if not applaud, the suffering of the poor. As though it reflected their personal weakness rather than the structure of society. 
and second, social Darwinism evolved into a reactionary type of white supremacy. Toward the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th, social Darwinism and its associated eugenics merged with white American racialist beliefs that would later be considered racist or discriminatory. For example, in 1916 amateur anthropologist and lawyer Madison Grant published The Passing of the Great Race or, The Racial Basis of European History. Grant propounded a theory of Nordic superiority and argued for a public eugenic program to save the Nordics from being overrun by non-white racial groups. Grant's book sold 1,600,000 copies by 1937. It was widely influential in individual beliefs and public policy that restricted immigration from Asia and discriminated harshly against African Americans. Did all 19th century thinkers believe in progress? Thomas Edison, 1847 to 1931, certainly did. In 1876, when he set up his laboratory in Menlo Park, New Jersey, he committed himself to a minor invention every 10 days and a big thing every 6 months or so. Edison did get about 40 patents a year and over 1,000 before he died. Not everyone was so enthusiastic about new machines, though. Thomas Carlyle, 1795-1881, for example, wrote in 1829 in Signs of the Times. An essay that was published in the Edinburgh Review. The signs being the age of machinery. That the shadow we have wantonly evoked stands terrible before us and will not depart at our bidding. Henry David Thoreau, 1817-1862, wrote in Walden, 1854. We do not ride upon the railroad, it rides upon us. Still, many did share Edison's optimism, and it was the popular national view. Timothy Walker, a lawyer from Ohio, wrote in the North American Review in 1831 that machines free ordinary people from burdensome labor and promote democracy. Did all 19th century thinkers believe in progress? Thomas Edison, 1847 to 1931, certainly did. In 1876, when he set up his laboratory in Menlo Park, New Jersey, he committed himself to a minor invention every 10 days and a big thing every 6 months or so. Edison did get about 40 patents a year and over 1,000 before he died. Not everyone was so enthusiastic about new machines, though. Thomas Carlyle, 1795-1881, for example, wrote in 1829 in Signs of the Times. An essay that was published in the Edinburgh Review. The Signs Being the Age of Machinery that the shadow we have wantonly evoked stands terrible before us and will not depart at our bidding. Henry David Thoreau, 1817-1862, wrote in Walden, 
1854. We do not ride upon the railroad, it rides upon us. Still, many did share Edison's optimism, and it was the popular national view. Timothy Walker, a lawyer from Ohio, wrote in the North American Review in 1831 that machines free ordinary people from burdensome labor and promote democracy. What is pragmatism? Pragmatism is a distinctively American philosophy that originated in community discussion groups and came to define the philosophy department at Harvard University during the late 19th century. While not as scientific in perspective as some philosophy in Europe during the same time, it represented an effort to think in a practical way. What is pragmatism? Pragmatism is a distinctively American philosophy that originated in community discussion groups and came to define the philosophy department at Harvard University during the late 19th century. While not as scientific in perspective as some philosophy in Europe during the same time, it represented an effort to think in a practical way. Who was Charles Sanders Pierce? Charles Sanders Pierce, 1839-1914, is recognized as the founder and originator of pragmatism. Although his intellectual expertise extended to logic, mathematics, economics, social science, the physical sciences, and geodesic work. Pierce's published writings date from 1857 until his death and constitute 12,000 printed pages. There are, in addition, 80,000 pages of his unpublished handwritten work. His principal works, published posthumously, are edited volumes, such as The New Elements of Mathematics. Four volumes, 1976, The Essential Pairs, two volumes, 1992 and 1998, and Writings of Charles S. Pierce, a chronological edition, five volumes, 1882 to 1993. Who was Charles Sanders Pierce? Charles Sanders Pierce, 1839-1914, is recognized as the founder and originator of pragmatism. Although his intellectual expertise extended to logic, mathematics, economics, social science, the physical sciences, and geodesic work. Pierce's published writings date from 1857 until his death and constitute 12,000 printed pages. There are, in addition, 80,000 pages of his unpublished handwritten work. His principal works, published posthumously, are edited volumes, 
such as the new elements of mathematics. Four volumes, 1976, The Essential Pairs, two volumes, 1992 and 1998, and writings of Charles S. Pairs, a chronological edition, five volumes, 1882 to 1993. What are some key facts about Charles Pierce's career and life? Charles Sanders Pierce, 1839-1914, was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts. His father, Benjamin, was professor of mathematics at Harvard University and a founder of the U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey and the Smithsonian Institution. Benjamin Pierce is also said to have built the Harvard Department of Mathematics. At the age of 12, young Charles discovered logic, and at 16, he began his independent study of philosophy. In 1859 he graduated from Harvard, unsure of what I would do in life. His primary interest was in logic, for which there were no career opportunities. He practiced geodesy for several years and returned to Harvard to study natural history and philosophy in 1861. He got a Ph.D. in chemistry in 1863, graduating summa cum laude. Pierce continued his studies of logic on his own and has been considered to be one of the greatest logicians of all times. Although he disagreed with Immanuel Kant's 1724 to 1804 insistence that space was Euclidean and later moved to Friedrich Hegel's 1770 to 1831 objective idealism. Kant remained a dominating influence over his philosophical ideas. Pierce's philosophy was a distinct form of pragmatism, which he called pragmaticism. What are some key facts about Charles Pierce's career and life? Charles Sanders Pierce 1839-1914, was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts. His father, Benjamin, was professor of mathematics at Harvard University and a founder of the U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey and the Smithsonian Institution. Benjamin Pierce is also said to have built the Harvard Department of Mathematics. At the age of 12, young Charles discovered logic, and at 16, he began his independent study of philosophy. In 1859 he graduated from Harvard, unsure of what I would do in life. His primary interest was in logic, for which there were no career opportunities. He practiced geodesy for several years and returned to Harvard to study natural history and philosophy in 1861. He got a Ph.D. in chemistry in 1863, graduating summa cum laude. Pierce continued his studies of logic on his own and has been considered to be one of the greatest logicians of all times. Although he disagreed with Immanuel Kant's 1724-1804, insistence that space was Euclidean and later moved to Friedrich Hegel's 1770-1831, objective idealism. 
Kant remained a dominating influence over his philosophical ideas. Pierce's philosophy was a distinct form of pragmatism, which he called pragmaticism. What are some key facts about Edmund Husserl's life and career? Husserl was born in Prosnitz, Moravia, which became part of Czechoslovakia after World War I and is now in the Czech Republic. His family was Jewish. Husserl studied mathematics in Leipzig and Berlin, and then got his PhD in Vienna in 1883, writing contributions to the calculus of variations that year. For the next two years, he studied psychology and philosophy with Franz Brentano. 1837-1917, and then went to the University of Halle for his habilitation. Preparation for university teaching, under a student of Brentano. He wrote on the concept of number, which he revised four years later in 1891, as philosophy of arithmetic. In 1886 Husserl converted to Christianity, taking the name Edmund Gustav Albrecht Husserl. The next year, he married Malvin Steinschneider, who was to prove a valuable source of information about his work and intentions to academic colleagues. They had a daughter and two sons. In 1901, the Husserls moved to the University of Göttingen. He was promoted to Ordenlichen Professor in 1906, and the next year he traveled to Italy to see Brentano. Husserl was at this time in correspondence with Wilhelm Dilthe and leading mathematicians, as well as philosophers about their work and his German psychologist and philosopher Karl Jaspers 1883 to 1969 visited him in 1913 the same year Edain was published while visiting his son Wolfgang who was injured in World War I who Searle experienced nicotine poisoning in 1916 Husserl was appointed to a professorship in Freiburg. Wolfgang was killed in action that year. For the next two years, Edith Stein was his assistant, as was philosopher Martin Heidegger. 1889-1976, for whom he obtained a lectureship and helped get an assistant professorship in 1919. The next year, his son Gerhard was wounded, although he recovered. Over the following decade, Husserl and Heidegger were in contact, exchanging ideas and manuscripts. Because of his Jewish birth, in 1933 the German government barred Husserl from using the library at Freiburg University or any other German academic institution. Although after an immediate public outcry, he was reinstated a week later by a decree. Husserl resigned from the Deutsche Akademie several months after that. His leaving was not only a matter of what had happened at Freiburg, but of the growing danger to all Jews in Germany at that time. He was then appointed to the School of Philosophy at the University of Southern California. But declined because his assistant, Eugen Fink, was not permitted to accompany him. Husserl was not allowed to participate in the Paris Congress of Philosophers. In 1937, 
At his cremation the next year, Yu Jinfink eulogized him. Fink had been Hu Searle's dedicated and collaborative research assistant for 10 years. In his own work, Fink was to eventually turn from Hu Searle's philosophical perspective to that of Heidegger. Hu Searle had only published six books during his lifetime. But he had a huge collection of papers and manuscripts. Fearing that the Nazis would destroy them, the Belgian philosopher Hermann Leo van Breda 1911-1974, took them out of Germany, where they became part of the Husserl archives in Louvain after World War II. What was Edmund Husserl's doctrine of intentionality? Husserl thought that the same objectivity of intentional objects that mathematical symbols have holds for all sorts of other objects, as well, including objects of perception and categorical objects, such as causal connections, states of affairs, and relations. When we describe an object we have an intellectual intuition of it, or our intention is fulfilled. Although in terms of what we do not know our intention of the object may be empty. At first, Husserl thought that what was given to us in consciousness was not the Kantian thing in itself. But he later claimed that in a manifold of appearances, the thing in itself can be given to consciousness, which is to say, known. This view was criticized as idealism because all objects for Husserl were objects of consciousness. Husserl later qualified his position by stating that the thing in itself given to consciousness was only given to consciousness as a complete object of consciousness, not as its own total reality. Basically, Husserl was claiming that everything we know, even if what we know is true, is nonetheless something like an idea in the mind, e. g, my cat is now sitting on my computer as I write this. That's a fact. But, as something that I am consciously aware of, it is also something in my mind. How does Martin Heidegger embarrass the Heideggerians? Heidegger's political beliefs and behavior when the Nazis came to power have generated much controversy. Based on the following documented facts. Heidegger paid dues as a member of the Enstap, or Nazi Party, from 1933 to 1945. In his inaugural address, in May 1933 as rector of Freiburg University, three months after Hitler came to power, he called for the students and faculty to serve the new regime, referring to the march our people has begun into its future. History and to the power to preserve, in the deepest way, the strengths which are rooted in soil and blood. In June 1933, he told the Heidelberg Student Association that the university must be integrated into the Volksgemeinschaft, people's community, and be joined together with the state. In August 1933, he established the rule that the rector would no longer be elected by the faculty but appointed by the Nazi Minister of Education, a position to which he was himself 
appointed in October 1933. In November 1933, he applied the Nazi laws on racial cleansing to the students at Freiburg. Awarding financial aid to Aryan students, but not to Jews or Marxists. Heidegger also secretly denounced to the Nazi government a number of Jewish or politically suspect professors at Freiburg. Such as Hermann Staudinger, who won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1953, and Eduard Baumgarten. The pragmatist philosopher who was teaching at Göttingen. Max Muller, the Catholic intellectual was fired by Heidegger as student leader and prevented from getting a lectureship. Edmund Husserl, 1859-1938, Heidegger's former teacher, was denied use of the university library at Freiburg because he was a Jew even though he had converted to Lutheranism. Heidegger and Husserl's intellectual relationship is examined in the film The Easter. Directed by David Barison and Daniel Ross in 2004. Although Heidegger resigned as rector in 1934. The next year he referred to the inner truth and greatness of National Socialism. At least until 1960, Heidegger maintained a friendly acquaintance with Eugen Fischer. The head of the Institute of Racial Hygiene in Berlin that employed the infamous Dr. Joseph Mengele as a researcher. Heidegger never repudiated Nazism after World War II. In his lecture on technology in 1949, he referred to the mechanism of agriculture. Saying, agriculture is now a motorized food industry in essence. The same as the manufacturing of corpses in the gas chambers and the extermination camps. The same as the blockade and starvation of the countryside, the same as the production of the hydrogen bombs. Many were offended by this comparison by Heidegger of murdered Jews to agricultural products. In a last interview before his death, Heidegger described the main task of thought as achieving a satisfactory relationship to technology. He said that National Socialism had that goal but that those people were far too limited in their thinking to acquire an explicit relationship to what is really happening today and has been underway for three centuries. In other words, his greatest disappointment with the Nazis was their failure in addressing the problem of technology. What happened to the founders of the ST? Lewis Philosophical Society They went on to distinctive careers. Henry C. Brockmeyer, 1826-1906, set up a law office and was elected to the Missouri Senate. He composed the Missouri Constitution in 1875, became lieutenant governor, and was acting governor from 1876 to 1877. Then he moved farther west, lived with the Creek Indians, and attempted to get his translation of Friedrich Hegel's, 1770 to 1831, Science of Logic, 1812 published, which he never did. He ended up whittling wood and making toothpicks, which he brought to St. Louis to sell. William Harris, 1835-1909, became a journalist and lecturer. 
head of the Concord School, and Missouri's first commissioner of education. Denton Jacques Snyder, 1841-1925, wrote more than 60 books. Including the intellectual history of the St. Louis Hegelians. He taught from kindergarten to college level at the Communal University of Chicago and set forth his Snide Ryan psychology in ten volumes. Snyder's most famous work is the St. Lewis Movement in Philosophy, Literature, Education, Psychology, 1920. Thomas Davidson, 1840-1900, who was another early member of the St. Lewis Society, founded the Breadwinners College in New York City and a summer school in Glenmore, New York, where he later lived. What was the most striking Native American contribution to American philosophy? There is growing recognition of the influence of Native American thought on 18th and 19th century Euro-American ideas, as well as later on in history. Contemporary pragmatist scholars have traced contemporary concerns with community well-being in a pluralistic society to early Native American attempts to negotiate with Euro-Americans. Others have identified deeper mainstream American cultural debts to indigenous peoples. Robert Piercig, the author of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, 1974. In his second book, Lila, 1991, draws a fascinating and neglected comparison between what was to become the distinctly direct and plain American style of speech. If not always writing, and speeches in English made by Native American Great Plains leaders. Piercig quotes Ten Bears, speaking in 1867 to other Native Americans and representatives from Washington. I was born on the prairie, where the wind blew free, and there was nothing to break the light of the sun. I was born where there were no enclosures, and where everything drew a free breath. I want to die there and not within walls. I lived like my father before me. And like them I lived happily. While pragmatists such as John Dewey, 1859-1952, were often prolix. Their writing was nevertheless direct and innocent of the high style of European abstraction and unnecessary embellishment. Their ideas were not unnecessarily complicated. The same can be said of much New England transcendentalist writing, although maybe not of the St. Louis Hegelians, of the more idealist pragmatists such as Charles Sanders Peirce. 1839-1914, and Josiah Royce, 1855-1916, or the process philosophers Alfred North Whitehead. 1861-1947, and his follower Charles Harchern, 1897-2000. How did Denton Jacques Snyder interpret Friedrich Hegel? Denton Jacques Snyder, 1841-1925, thought that Friedrich Hegel, 1770-1831, in the lectures on the history of philosophy. Berlin, 
1820 and published as the philosophy of history in 1858, was not able to achieve a full system of thought. But that his principle of evolution held the greatest promise for future philosophy. He read Hegel's Phenomenology of Mind, 1910, first published as Philosophy of Spirit in 1817. As a guide for how the individual can achieve total self-understanding. Through the analysis of his experience as a mirror of the history of his times. So the St. Louis Hegelians tried to analyze their own times as an expression of the Absolute. There was thus a comparison between Hegel's vision of the Absolute in Napoleon. Bonaparte and Snyder's understanding of the U.S. Civil War and the end of the Great St. Louis illusion, which was shattered by the civic realization that Chicago had outpaced them in population. Snyder's insight that Hegel's Phenomenology of Mind is a book written in a romantic style, which destroys romanticism, has been considered subtle and sophisticated by his commentators. He meant by this that Hegel had a grand project but ran out of optimism about human history and the absolute itself. What was the Native American philosophical tradition? There are as many Native American philosophies as there are distinct nations and tribes. Over most of its history, their philosophies were transmitted orally from one generation to the next. As American indigenous cultures and tribes were destroyed by war and the loss of ancestral lands. These transmissions were largely lost. Some transmissions were Recorded by early anthropologists in condescending ways that distorted them. There are contemporary attempts to reconstitute Native American traditional oral knowledge. As critiques of Western philosophy, religion, technology, and economics. Such critiques now form the content of Native American or Indigenous American studies. As well as the late 20th century philosophical subfield of Native American philosophy. However, the speeches of 18th and 19th century Native American leaders who sought to resist removal to reservations and preserve the lives, cultures, and lands of their peoples endure as unreconstituted early American philosophy. Noteworthy in this regard is T. Diuskin, who, when he spoke at treaty councils in Pennsylvania, began, I desire all that I have said, may be taken down aright. T. Diuskin. Tenskwatawa, and Sago with us spoke like Americans. Who were the St. Louis Hegelians? They were a group of philosophers and teachers who founded the St. Louis Philosophical Society in 1866 and began to publish the Journal of Speculative Philosophy in 1867. The founding members were Henry C. Brockmeyer, 1826-1906, William T. Harris, 1835-1909, and Denton Jacques Snyder, 1841 to 1925. 
Brock Meyer was a Prussian immigrant who had come to the United States in 1844, attended Brown University. Plied several trades, and lived in a hut, like Henry David Thoreau 1817-1862. Harris was a Yale dropout who came to St. Louis to teach Pittman shorthand. Brock Meyer and Harris undertook the project of translating Hegel's Science of Logic, 1812, into English. Snyder, who had graduated from Oberlin College, came to St. Louis in 1865 to teach at Christian Brothers College. How did the St. Did the Eastern philosophers interact much with the St. Louis Hegelians? Although they were not academic philosophers, the St. Louis philosophers were in conversation with the Eastern transcendental thinkers such as those of the Concord School of Philosophy, which had been organized by William Harris. 1835-1909, and transcendentalist Amos Bronson Alcott, 1799-1888. The Concord School held conferences during the summer from 1879-1887, to and when Alcott first visited Harris in St. Louis, he was abused by Henry C. Brockmeyer, 1826-1906, in what the Hegelian observers called the first bout between East and West. The result was celebrated as a victory for the West. Another famed Eastern philosopher, Ralph Waldo Emerson, 1803-1882, also visited the St. Louis Philosophical Society. Who was Frederick Douglass? Many contemporary scholars of race consider Frederick Douglass, born Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey. 1818-1895, to be the first liberatory African-American intellectual. In 1873, he was the vice presidential candidate when Victoria Woodhull was the first woman to run for U.S. president. Douglas began life as a slave, but was taught to read at the age of 12 by his owner's sister-in-law. He taught other slaves to read, and after a series of failed escapes he finally gained his freedom and became active in the Massachusetts anti-slavery movement. At 23 he began his distinguished and inspiring career of public speaking. He was present at the Seneca Falls Convention, where the American suffragist movement originated in 1848. Douglas toured Ireland and England in the mid-1840s and his supporters raised money to legally purchase his freedom in 1856, back in the United States. Douglas published newspapers, the most famous of which was the North Star, which had as the motto right is of no sex truth is of no color God is the father of us all, and we are all brethren. In the 1850s, Douglas spoke for school desegregation in New York during the U.S. Civil War. He promoted the rights of blacks to fight for the Union. When the Emancipation Proclamation was issued in 1862, he said, 
We were waiting and listening as for a bolt from the sky, we were watching, by the dim light of the stars for the dawn of a new day, we were longing for the answer to the agonizing prayers of centuries. In 1884, after his first wife had died, Douglas married Helen Pitts, a white suffragist from New York. Pitts had worked on Alpha, the 19th century radical women's publication. While living in Washington, D.C., Douglas' main writings are a narrative of the life of Frederick Douglas. An American Slave, 1845, The Heroic Slave, Autographs for Freedom, 1853. My Bondage and My Freedom, 1855, and Life and Times of Frederick Douglass, 1881, revised, 1892. He edited the North Star from 1847 to 1851, after which it became the Frederick Douglass paper. Was 19th century evolutionary thought connected to ideas of progress? Not directly, because evolution was an external force, whereas progress depended on individual human effort. But the two notions were frequently associated, as in the ideas of American industrialist Andrew Carnegie. In general, notions of progress formed both ideals and practical motivations. Society as a whole was believed to be progressing. And individuals were motivated to advance in life by becoming materially prosperous. The prosperity of society was largely believed to be a matter of technology. The 19th century was the first full-fledged machine age. And it saw the inventions and wide use of the cotton gin, locomotive, telegraph, and electric lights, to name just a few. Who was Martin Heidegger? Martin Heidegger, 1889-1976, was the phenomenological ontologist who first united existentialism with phenomenology. But later revealed that his true concern was ontology. He is considered one of the titans of Western philosophy and had more direct enduring influence over 20th century continental philosophy than any other thinker. Heidegger wrote extensively on the history of philosophy, developing his own phenomenological analyses. His main books include his doctoral dissertation The Doctrine of Judgment in Psychologism. 1914, his habilitation, in Europe, Ph.D. write two dissertations. One to get a degree as a scholar and the second to qualify them to teach on a university level. The Doctrine of Categories and Signification in Duns Scotus, 1914, his most famous being and time, 1927 and then Introduction to Metaphysics, 1953, What is Called Thinking, 1954, What is Philosophy? 1956, On the Way to Language, 1959, Nietzsche I and II, 1961, and Phenomenology and Theology, 1970. Transcripts of Heidegger's lectures were partly published in 1975, the complete works would constitute over 100 volumes. 
Heidegger is also known for articles on art and poetry. As well as his essay The Question Concerning Technology. Who was Tenskwatawa? The prophet, Tenskwatawa, also known as Tenskatawa, Tenskwatawa, or by his original name. Lala Ithika, 1775-1834, was the brother of the Shawnee leader Tecumseh. Tenskwatawa was a powerful orator who preached a return to Native American. Traditions as a form of resistance against destruction and oppression suffered. In a speech to Governor William Henry Harrison in 1810, he expressed what was later to become a broadly American form of self-creation. Combined with biting wit, it is true I am a Shawnee. My forefathers were warriors. Their son is a warrior. From them I take only my existence, from my tribe I take nothing. I am the maker of my own fortune, and oh. That I could make of my own fortune, and oh. That I could make that of my red people, and of my country. As great as the conceptions of my mind, when I think of the spirit that rules the universe. I would not then come to Governor Harrison to ask him to tear the treaty and to obliterate the landmark. But I would say to him, Sir, you have liberty to return to your own country. Lewis Hegelians apply their philosophy? The ST. Lewis Hegelians tried to apply their philosophy directly to current events. They were very proud of St. Louis. In contrast to Chicago. Due to an error in the 1870 census, the ST. Lewis Hegelians, along with other residents of the city. We're thrilled by the statistic that the population of S.T. Lewis was greater than that of Chicago. On October 8, 1871, the day of the Great Chicago Fire. Believed to have been started by a kick to a lamp from M.R.S. O'Leary's cow, although overall conditions were extremely dry and INFL amable. Snyder asked Brockmeyer what he thought of this disaster. Brockmeyer's reply, note, Snyder spelled Brockmeyer's name as Brockmeyer, according to Snyder, was. Chicago was the completely negative city of our West and indeed of our time. And now she has carried out her principle of negation to its final universal consequence, she has simply negated herself. The positive result of that negative is bound to arrive, but not over there in the same place again. But here, here in our St. Louis. But alas. The 1880 census put the population of St. Louis below that of Chicago. The St. Louis Philosophical. Society hired a mathematician from Washington University to check the census figures. He told them that the 1870 census had been in error and that the population of St. Louis really was 350,000 compared to 503,000 in Chicago.
Who was Edith Stein? Edith Stein, 1891-1942, was canonized by Pope John Paul II in 1998 as Saint Teresa Benedicta of the Cross. She was born into an observant Jewish family in the Central European region of Silesia, which was then part of the German Empire. In 1932 she denounced the Nazi regime to Pope Pius XI. She converted to Roman Catholicism in 1922 and was received into the Discalced Carmelite Order in 1934 in a retaliatory move against Jewish converts in the Netherlands, where the Carmelites had sent Stein for safety. She and her sister Rosa were transported to the Auschwitz concentration camp. They died there in the gas chamber in 1942. Stein was a student of Edmund Husserl, 1859-1938. First at Göttingen University and then at Freiburg, where she became his assistant. Her doctorate was on the problem of empathy. She became a faculty member at Freiburg University after working with Martin Heidegger in preparing Husserl's manuscripts for publication. As a Jewish woman, she was barred from further postgraduate studies at Freiburg and other German universities. She finally gave up her assistantship to Husserl and began to teach in Catholic girls' schools. Learning about Thomas Aquinas, see 1225 to 1274 and Catholic philosophy in general. She did become a lecturer at the Institute for Pedagogy at Munster, but had to give it up due to anti-Semitic laws in 1933, the same year that her former colleague Martin Heidegger, 1889 to 1976 was made rector of Freiburg University. The miracle Edith Stein is supposed to have performed that of curing a child who had overdosed on acetaminophen in response to a prayer from relatives is disputed by some Jewish groups who claim it is not clear whether she is a genuine martyr. Her legacy includes numerous writings, some of which were translated into English in the 1980s and 1990s. Life in a Jewish Family, her unfinished autobiographical account, 1986. On the Problem of Empathy, 1989, Essays on Women, 1996, and The Hidden Life, 1993. Stein also wrote Knowledge and Faith, Finite and Eternal Being. An Attempt to an Ascent to the Meaning of Being, Philosophy of Psychology and the Humanities. Self-Portrait in Letters, which have not yet been translated into English or published. How did Edmund Husserl separate mathematics and logic from psychology? First, Husserl distinguished between numbers that are the result of counting actual objects before us and numbers as symbols. Clearly, most of mathematics deals with numbers as symbols. Husserl claimed that symbolic numbers, as well as propositions and universals, cannot be reduced to mental states, as psychologism claimed, as intentional objects of consciousness, 
in Franz Brentano's. 1837-1917, Sense of Intentionality, these logical and mathematical entities are objective. What is pragmatism? Pragmatism is a distinctively American philosophy that originated in community discussion groups and came to define the philosophy department at Harvard University during the late 19th century. While not as scientific in perspective as some philosophy in Europe during the same time, it represented an effort to think in a practical way. In his case, it was, why should a human being not commit suicide? The question arose for him from his apprehension of the human condition as absurd. Together with the absence of God and a forever frustrated search for meaning. Camus was a friend of Jean-Paul Sartre, 1905-1980, but they became alienated from each other as a result. Of Camus' critique of communist tyranny in his essay I'm Favor of Revolutionary Struggle, The Rebel, 1951. His novel The Plague, 1947, dramatized the ever-presence of death in human life. In his nonfiction essay The Myth of Sisyphus, 1942, Camus claims that meaning can be found by affirming the absurd and then rebelling against it, as in Imagine Sisyphus Happy. Sisyphus' punishment by Zeus consists of eternally rolling a large boulder up a mountain, only to begin again after he has reached the top and the boulder has rolled down again. His crimes were first to put death in chains and then escape death himself. Camus was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1957. His own death in a car crash raised the question of his suicide. Paul Ricoeur, 1913-2005, wrote on a variety of subjects including existentialism, phenomenology, ethics, psychology, and theory of language. All of his work was distinguished by a deep engagement with key figures in the history of philosophy. His Freedom and Nature, 1950, was received as a rejection of Sartre's theory of freedom. Ricoeur argued that willing always has an involuntary component which works as a kind of built-in resistance. What is voluntary consists of motive, decision, and consent, each of which has its own involuntary moment. The involuntary moments include birth, death, character already developed, the body, and the unconscious. First, it's not clear that Sartre equated freedom with acts of will. Because freedom is present in all consciousness. Second, Sartre would have said that what we accept or recognize as involuntary requires a free choice of bestowing that particular meaning. Which early American philosophical strains were most influential? The thought of several Native American orators, the St. 
Lewis Hegelians, the Transcendentalists of New England. And writers on evolution all influenced pragmatist philosophy, either directly or by their emphasis of what were to become enduring American themes to be taken up by pragmatists and others. What were the ideas of some of the humanist existentialists? Hans Jonas, 1903-1993, was influenced by phenomenology as well as existentialism. But some of his most original work has been directly relevant to environmental concerns and thought about the nature of life. In the Imperative of Responsibility, 1979. He argues for ethical responsibility for the planet to fight the incursions of technology. In the Phenomenon of Life, 1966, he argues against standard biological approaches that objectify living things and seek to explain their behavior via mere chemistry or mechanistic hereditary forces. Jonas' positive thesis is that all life forms, even single cells, have some form of awareness and they strive from their own physicality and perspective on the world. Awareness on a cellular level does not imply the presence of the cogito a mind it is. Sufficient if the living entity behaves in a way that enhances its life, or attempts to do so. Emmanuel Levinas, 1905-1995, was a French Jewish philosopher who was originally from Lithuania. Levinas criticized the philosophical tradition in which things other than an Individual mind are represented to that mind in ideas or some other mental content. He thought that the paradigm for understanding consciousness was the face-to-face -face interactions between human beings. Such interactions are both particular and indescribable, as well as of inestimable importance. Lavina's main works are Totality and Infinity, 1964, Otherwise Than Being or Beyond Essence. 1974, Difference and Transcendence, 1999, and Between Us, 1998. Albert Camus, 1913-1960, like Søren Kierkegaard, 1813-1855, had a burning question. 